Hello again, everyone. Welcome back. I'm so glad you're here. In this video, we're going to be looking at how Uriah Smith used the word person when he was describing what it means for God to be a person. Now, overall, what we're doing in this series, this is just one video in a broader series of videos, but it'll make sense to you just on its own. You don't have to go back and see anything previous to this. Uh, but I invite you to, they're also very relevant and I think it will be helpful. But what we're doing is we're going through articles by the pioneers, including Ellen White. And we are um, taking a look and seeing what did they mean when they said God is a person or that God has a personality or when they said God is not an impersonal being, what did they mean by that? Now, the reason this is important to do is because Ellen White said that the personality of God is everything to us as a people. And it's literally impossible to explain in one video how inclusive that really is, like how impactful this statement really is. Um, so I'm, I'm just having to go through bit by bit in this series and share little pieces here and there. So again, you'll, you'll see a lot of similar content from pioneer to pioneer because they all taught the same thing about what it means for God to be a person, but each one did so in a slightly different way. You know, each person writes a little bit differently and all that. But as we saw in some of our earlier videos already, Ellen White said that all of the early believers came into harmony on the pillar doctrines and that the personality of God is one of these pillar doctrines. Here's one statement that we've looked at where she identifies the personality of God as a pillar of our faith. And in this same manuscript, she promotes the writings of the pioneers on this topic by saying that the pioneers who have died and who wrote on the pillar doctrine of the personality of God, their writings should be reprinted. Now, keep in mind, this statement was made in 1905, and she's talking about the pioneers in our work in relation to that date. Now, we think of 1905 as a pioneering time, right? Because it's so far in the past from 2023. But the Seventh-day Adventist movement emerged in 1844, right? So the pioneers, if you go from 1844 and you go ahead by 30 years, 30, 40 years, if you go 40 years, that's 1884, right? 1844 plus 40, 1884. So it, you have to go way far back in order to really get to the pioneers in our movement um, from the perspective of 1905. So that's just something that I was thinking of recently that I thought, wow, you know, it's easy for us to think the pioneers includes, you know, people who came in later on, but those who were actually pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist movement didn't consider the new converts or the newly born children who then grew up and became Seventh-day Adventists, those weren't the pioneers of the movement. They, you know, the people like Joseph Bates and Ellen White and James White and Uriah Smith and David Arnold and just to name a few, you know, Stephen Pierce, um, some of the people that Ellen White named and we saw earlier um, in another video, those were the pioneers. And she says, they came into harmony. They accepted as light direct from heaven, the revelations given to her. She instructed them as to how they were to teach on these pillar doctrines. And that's what they did. They taught these pillar doctrines. They all came into harmony. So Ellen White endorsed the reprinting of their articles. And um, wow, Uriah Smith wrote a lot on a lot of topics, really. But he wrote a lot on this topic, the personality of God, here are just a few instances of articles and books where you can find information relative to what it means for God to be a person. This is the article we're going to be looking at in this video. It's from 1872 and it's 
out of the ones that I've found and I've, um, I may not have found all of them because there's just a whole lot, but I've been looking into this for quite some time and I've compared them. And this seems to be the most condensed version of his explanation for what it means for God to be a person. But I'm going to have links to everything in the description. So you'll be able to easily find all of these other books and articles that I've already shown you, and you'll be able to compare them for yourselves. And I recommend that you do that. It's important for us to spend, you know, personal time getting firsthand information. And this, even though I'm going to be quote, quoting uh, quite a bit from the article, I'm still not quoting the whole thing. So I hope that you'll go and take a closer look at the fuller article. It will shed more light on what we're going to be talking about here. But the title of the article um, in this issue of the Review and Herald is called The Image of God. And really the context of, uh, is, I'm skipping the first part. Okay, so the context for what is about to be read here is Uriah Smith is addressing the common Christian view that God is without body and parts, right? And that to be made in the image of God then implies that mankind is inherently immortal, that we have this immaterial part of ourselves, that that's the image of God, the immaterial part of ourselves, and that we therefore have immortality. So when we die, our immortal immaterial soul, you know, goes to heaven where God is and that heaven is beyond the bounds of time and space because God is beyond the bounds of time and space. And that's where God dwells, et cetera, et cetera. You know, he addresses all of this. And then he's saying that um, this is not what it means to be in the image of God. Okay. But so anyway, that's just a very, very brief context. I'll just pick up here with what I have on the slide. Again, this is skipping a few paragraphs in his article, but he, he picks up here and he says, in what respect then is man in the image of his maker? A universal rule of interpretation applying to Bible language as well as any other is to allow every word its most obvious and literal import unless some plain reason exists for giving it a mystical or figurative meaning. The plain and literal definition of image is, as given by Webster, quote, an imitation representation or similitude of any person or thing sculptured, drawn, painted, or otherwise made perceptible to the sight, a visible presentation, a copy, a likeness, an effigy, end quote. He goes on to write, we have italicized a portion of this definition as containing an essential idea, an image must be something that is visible to the eye. Okay. Now our video isn't intended to be defining what he meant by image. It's intended to be defining what he meant by person, right? But in so doing, he's going through defining what it means to be in the image of God. And then he's going to use that as part of his um, way of explaining what God's image is. It's what he starts off with. In what respect then is man in the image of his maker? Because he had just got through saying man isn't in the image of God in respect to immortality. That's not what it is. So what is it? Okay, so he's getting ready to tell us. He goes on to say, how can we conceive of an image of anything that is not perceptible to the sight and which we cannot take cognizance of by any of the senses? He's basically just saying like this definition by Webster that we just read where um, it has to be something that is perceptible to the sight, something that is visible. Hey, that makes sense because we couldn't even conceive of an image of anything that isn't perceptible to the sight and which we can't take cognizance of by any of the senses, right? How could you imagine anything that is totally not able to be sensed. He goes on to say, even an image formed in the mind, even something we're thinking of, right? Even an image formed in the mind must be conceived of as having some sort of outward shape 
or form. In this sense of having outward form, the word is used in each of the 31 times of its occurrence elsewhere in the Old Testament, elsewhere being outside of Genesis chapter 1, because that's what he's um, addressing, is what it means to be made in the image of God based off of what it says in Genesis chapter 1, that God made man in his image, okay? So in each of the instances, the 31 times of its occurrence elsewhere in the Old Testament, he says it's used, you know, with this sense of having an outward shape or form. The second time the word image is used, so the second time in Genesis, the second time it is used, it is used to show the relation existing between son and father, so Adam and his son Seth, and is a good comment on the relation which Genesis 1, chapter 26, 27 asserts to exist between man and God. So he's saying uh, Genesis 1, 26 and 27 asserts that there's this relation between God and man. Man is in the image of God. And he says that same image of relationship is portrayed further on in Genesis in relation to the son and father of human beings, right? So he quotes Genesis 5, verse 3. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image, end quote. Uriah Smith goes on to say, no one would think of referring this to anything but physical resemblance. Now put the two passages together. So the two passages being Genesis 1, 26 and 27 and Genesis 5, 3. He's saying, let's put those passages together. Moses first asserts that God made man in his own image after his likeness. And a few chapters further on asserts that this same man begat a son in his own likeness after his image. And while all must admit that this latter refers to bodily form or physical shape, the theological schools tell us that the former so the one in Genesis chapter one, from the same writer, the same author, and with no intimation that it is used in any other sense, must refer solely to the attribute of immortality. Okay. He goes on to say, is not this taking unwarrantable liberty with the inspired testimony? There is no room for any other conclusion than that just as a son is in outward appearance, the image of his father. So man possesses not the nature and attributes of God in all their perfection, but a likeness or image of him in his physical form. So Uriah Smith is really stressing the fact that to be made in the image of God refers to being made to look like God looks physically. Okay. A physical appearance. Then he goes on to quote, I'm going to skip some, some more stuff there, but um, be sure and check out the full article. He goes on to say, but here the mystical interpretation of our current theology has thrown up what is considered an insuperable objection to this view. And it is still the same view that we just saw. He hasn't changed. I mean, check it out in the, in the article, but he hasn't changed the context uh, of what he's talking about. He's saying that Man is when a father has a son and you say he's in the image of his father, it, you're talking about physical form, right? And that applies to man being made in the image of God. It's talking about physical form. But the current theology says, no, that can't be true. So the objection is that can't be true because or for because how can man be physically in the image of God when God is not a person, is without form, and has neither body nor parts? I just want to remind us that what we're wanting to do is really just try to see what does Uriah Smith mean by the word person? So here we find the first real indicator for what Uriah Smith means by the word person. So at the bottom of the slide there, even though he's quoting what objectors say to the view he's promoting, 
it still gives us insight into what he meant by person. So the objectors say, how can man be physically in the image of God when God is not a person, is without form and has neither body nor parts? So for Uriah Smith to say, this is what objectors say, God is not a person, and then to say is without form and has neither body nor parts, it's pretty clear that he means a person does have a form, a person does have a body or parts. Now, I just want to say, just to be clear, I don't think any Christians today and probably very few in Uriah Smith's day would have said that God is not a person. That's not what they said, but they just defined what it means for God to be a person differently than how early SDAs defined what it means for God to be a person. Okay, that's super important. Now, he used the word person to mean the same as a being. He, early SDAs used person and being synonymously. They used it to mean the same thing. But that's not the case amongst other Christianity, uh, uh, Christian groups. For instance, in the doctrine of the Trinity, there's a clear distinction between God being a being and God being a person. They aren't the same thing. But we're not here to talk about Trinitarianism. That's not the point. The point is, what did Uriah Smith mean by person? And it's just, these are nuances to what early SDAs said and how they taught the pillar doctrine of the personality of God that sometimes, or very often, in fact, is overlooked. So here he says that objectors say God is not a person. God is without form and has neither body nor parts. So that gives us a clue to what he means by person. A person has a form, has a body and parts. Then he goes on to say, in reply, we ask, where does the Bible say that God is a formless, impersonal being having neither body nor parts? Okay, now there's another variation of the word person. It's impersonal. So in reply to the assertion that God is not a person, God doesn't have a form, God doesn't have a body or parts, he says, where does the Bible say that God is a formless, impersonal being having neither body nor parts? So that shows us by impersonal, Uriah Smith meant formless, having neither body nor parts. And so we can know that to take off the prefix M, I am, if you take off the prefix and you have personal, the M prefix negates the word personal. It means not or non. So to say impersonal means not personal. And if a not personal being is a formless being having neither body nor parts, a personal being is a form or a being with a form having a body or parts. Notice it's not referring to how congenial an individual is. It's not talking about character traits. If you're nice or benevolent or whatever, personal being is referring to a bodily being, a, per, um, a being with a body with parts, right? Okay, so that shows us what he meant by impersonal as well as by personal. Then he goes on to say, in the voice of the objector, does it not say that he is a spirit? John 4, 24, Uriah Smith answers, Yes, it does. You know, yes. And we inquire again. Does it not say that the angels are spirits? Hebrews 1, verses 7 and 14. And are not the angels saying nothing of those instances in which they have appeared to men in bodily form and always in human shape? Are not the angels always spoken of as beings having bodily form? So his point there is, yes, God is said to be a spirit. But so are angels, and angels are always said to have bodily forms. 
So his point is being a spirit doesn't mean you don't have a bodily form. It doesn't mean you're impersonal with no body or parts. He goes on to say a spirit or spiritual being as God is in the highest sense, so far from not having a bodily form must possess it as the instrumentality for the manifestation of his powers. In other words, he's like, if God didn't have a bodily form, if God was formless, there's nothing through which to manifest his power to begin with. And if there's no manifestation of his power that he it just may as well not even exist, right? There would be nothing happening. Okay. Now you might take note of the fact that he's calling a spirit, a spiritual being, and that God is a spiritual being in the highest sense. So anyway, we'll move on now. And uh, he goes on to say more things. And then he says, we now invite the attention of the reader to a little of the evidence that may be presented to show that God is a person. And so that man, though, of course, in an imperfect and finite degree, may be an image or likeness of him as to his bodily form. So we're getting ready to see evidence, a little of the evidence that may be presented to show that God is a person. So in other words, we've already seen what he means by uh, impersonal, personal, and person to a degree, but we're going to see even more. And it's all designed to be sh uh, showing or evidencing that man can be in the image of God as to bodily form. Okay. So here's the first piece of evidence. God has made visible to mortal eyes parts of his person. Moses saw the God of Israel, Exodus 33, 21 through 23. An immaterial being, if such a thing can be conceived of without body or parts, cannot be seen with mortal eyes. Now, let's just think about that for a short while. We saw earlier that he was um, denying the idea that God is an impersonal being, having neither body nor parts, having no form, a formless, impersonal being without body and parts. And now he says an immaterial being is a being without body or parts, right? But of course, the point he's making is you can't even conceive of an immaterial being. You really can't. And he goes on to explain why. So I won't go into all those details, but just take note of the fact that He's using the term immaterial being in the same way he used the term impersonal being. And you can see that on one of the previous slides. He goes on to say, to say that God assumed a body and shape for this occasion, the occasion uh, talked about in Exodus 33, to say that God assumed a body and shape for this occasion places the common view in a worse light still. Now, the common view that he's referring to is the, the common idea that God is a formless being without a body or parts, that God is an immaterial being, right? He's saying that that's the common view and that to say that in addition to just saying that God is immaterial or impersonal, to say that he then assumed a body, that he manifested himself with a body for the occasion of showing it to Moses, that that's even worse. To say God assumed a body and shape for this occasion places the common view in a worse light still, for it is virtually charging upon God a double deception. First, giving Moses to understand that he was a being with body and parts. And secondly, so the second deception, under the promise of showing himself, showing Moses something that was not himself. Okay, now that is really significant because remember, Moses saw the God of Israel. 
And to say that that was just a special manifestation of God who normally isn't in bodily form, who normally is immaterial, and then just kind of materialized with a body that isn't really him that's charging God with double deception, saying, you know, giving Moses the, the idea that he had a body and parts and then showing himself um, or showing something that really wasn't himself. Okay. Uriah Smith goes on to write, and he told Moses that he would put his hand over him as he passed by and then take it away that he might see his back parts, but not his face. Has he hands? Has he back parts? Has he a face? If not, why try to convey the ideas by means of language? Again, Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 of the elders saw the God of Israel. That's referenced in um, Exodus 24, verses 9 through 11. And he quotes, And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone. End quote. Uriah Smith asks, Has he feet? Or is the record that these persons saw them a fabrication? In other words, is it just a lie? No man, to be sure, has seen his face, nor could he do it and live as God has declared. Exodus thirty-three twenty, John 1, 18. Okay, then he moves on. So in other words, his point is like, look, the scriptures say Moses saw God's back. And that Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 of the elders saw at least God's feet. The description says, you know, the, the record says that there was um, some, you know, a, a paved work like a sapphire stone under God's feet. Well, they saw his feet. Did, did they see it or not? Was it was that really God's feet or not? Or was it just a made up account? Did it not even really happen? And then he's like, look, yes, it's true. No man has seen God's face because you couldn't do that and live as God has declared. Okay. So. Of course, after sin, obviously. Um, there's an article that I didn't include in the video that I made on David Arnold, but I referenced it and it's in the description to the video for David Arnold. And he goes into a lot of detail regarding um, when things changed to where mankind could no longer be able to see God face to face, but that God definitely has a face and prior to the fall, you know, and Ellen White writes about this too, but I'm just showing that the pioneers were all in harmony with what Ellen White said. And that when Ellen White endorsed their articles, she did so for good reason, um, particularly on this topic. Okay, so evidence number two that Uriah Smith gives to show that God is a person and has a bodily form he says, Christ as manifested among men is declared to be the image of God and in his form. Christ showed after his resurrection that his immortal, though not then glorified body had flesh and bones. Then he references Luke 24, 29. Smith says bodily he ascended into heaven where none can presume to deny him a local habitation. I mean, if, if you're bodily, you have a local habitation. You're just in one place at a time. But Paul, speaking of this same Jesus, says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now, he's talking about this same Jesus, the one with flesh and bones, the one with a body, the one occupying a local habitation. Smith says, Paul, speaking of this same Jesus, says that he is the image of the invisible God. Okay. Now he goes on to write, here the antithesis expressed is between God who is invisible and his image in the person of Christ, which was visible. It follows, therefore, that what of Christ the disciples could see, which was his bodily form, was the image to give them an idea of God whom they could not see. 
again, quote, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, end quote, Philippians 2, 5 and 6. It remains to be told how Christ could be in the form of God and yet God have no form. Okay, now let's take note of a few key things here. The person of Christ was his bodily form. This is showing us what Uriah Smith meant by the word person. So if he's saying God is a person, it's all pointing to the fact that God has a physical bodily form. And as we saw on the previous slide, occupies a local habitation. Okay. Now Uriah Smith goes on to say once more, quote, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, etc., Hebrews 1, 1 to 3. Okay, so that's all Uriah Smith there, quoting Hebrews 1, 1 to 3, and he italicized express image of his person. Like, he's quoting that for that reason. He says, this testimony is conclusive. It is an inspired declaration that God has a personal form. And to give an idea of what that form is, it declares that Christ, just as we conceive of him as ascended up bodily on high, is the express image thereof. Now, notice here some of these other key parts. If God has a personal form, what does Uriah Smith mean by personal in this context? Clearly, he's not talking about benevolent character traits. Personal form refers to bodily form. So for God to be a personal being and a spiritual being and a physical being, these are all being used in the very same way to refer to a bodily being, not an immaterial being. Remember, an immaterial being, if such a thing could even be conceived of the way Uriah Smith put it, right? You have to have a physical form in order to exist. So this is what he means by person, personal, impersonal, that sort of thing. Now, in describing the fact that Jesus, even after his resurrection and ascension into heaven, that Jesus was the express image of his father's person and that he had flesh and bones even after his resurrection. This is just a whole lot of reiteration and re-emphasis that Uriah Smith is writing to drive home the point that Jesus went to um, to heaven bodily. And we know that God's habitation is in heaven. Uh, the scriptures say that God is in heaven, right? And that Jesus is the express image in bodily form. Now, this is exactly what Ellen White has said in many places of her writings. And this is an excellent um just such a parallel description of what we just saw from Uriah Smith regarding Jesus ascending to heaven. This is from volume three of the Spirit of Prophecy, page 254. And she says, the most precious fact to the disciples in the ascension of Jesus was that he went from them into heaven in the tangible form of their divine teacher. Now, before I read the rest, there's a whole lot of implications from that one sentence. There's just not time to go into it all. But if you read Ellen White's writings closely, if you read and pay attention to how she and the early pioneers emphasized over and over the tangible existence, the tangible realities, the material realities of heaven, of God, of of existence and they over and over denied 
the idea of immateriality existing at all. It'll start to make a whole lot more sense why they pointed to this material resurrection, material existence on the earth made new repeatedly as the hope that is in us, right? And Elmai says it was the most precious fact to the disciples that Jesus went to heaven in the tangible form. Now, why would that be the most precious fact? Reading the fuller context of her writings will help fill in the rest of that picture. But just let's just see here the rest of her statement and see how parallel it is to what we just read from Uriah Smith. She says, the very same Jesus who had walked and talked and prayed with them, who had broken bread with them, who had been with them in their boats on the lake, who had sought retirement with them in the groves, and who had that very day toiled with them up the steep ascent of all of it, the very same Jesus had ascended to heaven in the form of humanity. And the heavenly messengers had assured them that the very same Jesus whom they had seen go up into heaven should come again in like manner as he had ascended. This assurance has ever been and will be till the close of time the hope and joy of all true lovers of Christ. There's important stuff here that really matters. And the personality of God being everything to us as a people is closely related to the fact that the assurance that Jesus went to a real place in the tangible form, I mean, look look at all of these. I just changed the color to blue in several places. The tangible nature of Jesus' ascension to heaven. It was the very same Jesus who, even though he now had a glorified body, the very same Jesus who had lived and, and walked and talked and ate and, and sought retirement with the disciples, who had been with them on the boats, and even that very day had toiled with them up the steep ascent to all of it or of all of it, that same Jesus went to heaven in the form of humanity. Now, the fact that Jesus went to a real place, that he didn't go to some ethereal, vapor-like, non-physical realm, but he went to a real physical place, shows that there are realities awaiting us, not imaginary experiences, not something uh, immaterial and non-physical, something that we can't even conceive of. Heaven is not a vapor, she told John Harvey Kellogg. It is a place. And throughout the writings of the pioneers, um, you can see them repeatedly pointing to that fact that Jesus, when he went to heaven, he didn't evaporate and get dispersed everywhere. Heaven isn't everywhere. Heaven is a place and that's where God is. Okay. So in reviewing some of the ways that Uriah Smith described, you know, Jesus and his bodily existence and how he was the express image of his father's person. Of course, that's just quoting from the new Testament, right? But he's pointing to that as conclusive testimony that God the Father has a personal form just like Jesus has a personal form and that it's not referring to character traits. Personal isn't here referring to character traits. It's referring to bodily form. So throughout the course of this video, Uriah Smith has done a very clear job of explaining what he means by person and what he doesn't mean by person. And this is a key part to understanding the pillar doctrine within the Seventh-day Adventist Church of the personality of God, something that is everything to us as a people. And we will see throughout the series more and more of why it's everything to us as a people. Why is it so important to understand what it means for God to be a person? Now, Next time, we're going to be looking at a pioneer whose name is less familiar to most people, 
but it, it's an excellent article. You will not want to miss it. D.W. Hall, that's who we're going to be looking at next time. So be sure and come back for that. Thank you so much for joining us.